Welcome to Founderline, the show where we answer your questions about startups. I'm your host, Joe Beninato. Thanks for joining us. It's great to have you all with us. Founderline is all about helping people with their startups. So we try and take questions from people out in the audience and have them answered by experienced entrepreneurs and investors. You might be someone who's thinking about starting a company or you might have already started a company and you're facing a challenging issue uh, that, you're, that you're working on right now. Maybe you're someone who's thinking about taking a job at a startup and uh, you want to ask something about the best way to evaluate that opportunity. Um, in any of those cases, if you have a question, we want to try and help you today. Uh, this is a live show and it only works if you send us questions. And the two easiest ways to do that are to send them via email to help at founderline.com or to tweet them to us at uh, the Twitter handle is at Founderline. With that, let's get started. Our guest today is Kirsten Green, the founder and managing partner of Forerunner Ventures in San Francisco. Kirsten's invested in over 30 early stage companies, including Bonobos, Dollar Shave Club, and Warby Parker. Kirsten, welcome, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Joe, for having me. It is so great to have you here. It's good uh, to see you. Yes, likewise. So um, usually, before we dive into questions, um, I usually ask a few questions of our guests just to warm them up a little bit, get okay. them going. Um, so let's start. Um, uh, you know, that one of the things when we first met that I found most intriguing about you was your path to the world of venture capital, which is very different than sort of the, the engineering geek who graduated <laughs> from, you know, an engineering school and then started a technology company and then eventually found their way into, uh, you know, investing in companies. Yep. So walk us through sort of how you got to uh, starting Forerunner Ventures and going into the venture capital world. Okay. Well, you're right. It was maybe a little bit of a circuitous or different kind of path, but yep. I really have, I've been investing for my career. Um, so I, you know, started some early early job was to be a research analyst at Montgomery Securities, which That's right. was an investment bank in San Francisco, and a really fun, great place to work in the '90s. Um, it was a tech boom that was happening here in the Bay Area. It was an entrepreneurial-based firm that um, was heavily involved in the early stage tech scene, yeah. taking a lot of companies public I remember. when it was viable to take small cap companies public. Um, and a big area of opportunity um, for the firm was retail. And at that time, retail was being fueled by real estate, um, the rise of the malls. Um, and kind of the, the new idea of a specialty store and a vertically integrated retailer. And this mm. is kind of the decade where The Gap grew up and all the limited brands and um, all the teen retailers, Abercrombie & Fitch, American Eagle, all of those. So this is what? what it was in the 90s. 90s? Like, you know, it, was really, okay. it started in the early 90s and I kind of peaked towards the end of the 90s like okay. most things did during that decade. Yep. And, um, you know, I caught, a, I caught a good wave where there was a lot of opportunity. And I, um, despite being new to the business and junior on the team, I was able to identify a way to kind of do something unique, and that was spending a lot of time in the malls um, and being close to the consumer. Like going to the malls, right? Like hum going to the malls. I mean, literally every Friday, I would go to the same four malls in the Bay Area. Um, they were, you know, 1A, 1B, 1C property and kind of observe what was going on. Um, and see how many cars were in the parking lot, how many people were in the malls, did they have bags, were they in stores, was the product being touched and tried on, or was it sitting neatly on shelves? Was mm. there more merchandise on sale in the back of the store than there was newly presented in the front of the store? Um, were people shopping or were people hanging out at the food court? And I think you know it was never about what was happening in any one week per se, but it was about the trend that you could see happening in the same malls over the course of a month or a season. Wow, um, that's and awesome. It was fun. I liked the hands-on. I liked going there and like really thinking about like why would somebody walk into the store and choose to buy something or not buy something and watch kind of the path to pur to purchase and um, to me it made a financial business fun, right? So like I think just looking at models and understanding kind of uh, the revenue outlook and how that was relating to the stock price was yeah. pretty basic and it was hard to differentiate yourself. But if you had a point of view on the business category, um, in this case, if you had a point of view on the product um, or what was going on with the consumer, you could have a different opinion maybe and that was a way to stand out. And this um, fed into your your research so you could say, yeah. oh, the and gap started, is trending up because yeah. of whatever, right? Yeah. Their product selection or something. And um, so I, I think I really fell in love with the, with the category. 
Um, hmm. And I liked being an investor. Um, I still love being an investor. I mean, I remember when I used to sit around and think I can't, you know, sometimes can't believe I get paid to learn about things <laughs> all the time. Um, always meeting new people, always kind of challenging yourself to think differently about things. So I really enjoyed that part. And during my tenure at Montgomery, I moved from being on the equity research side, which is what we call the sell side, you opine on stocks, um, to on the buy side and to actually making investments. And during the course of the eight years that I was in the, in the public market investing, you know, the cycle really played out. And the beginning, it was about what was hot, new, trending. Yep. At the end of the cycle, it was, uh, we over, you know, arguably, we overstored the country. We did this while Amazon and eBay became big companies. People better reevaluate their cost structure and think about rationalizing that and closing stores, et cetera. And I think, you know, at that point, it was, it was less exciting for me. And I, it. It, it became obvious that just the financial part of it was not enough, that I really loved the energy of the newness. And I really, you know, the world was different than on the investment banking side. Research analysts sometimes got brought in early, even before companies where clients are being banked, and right. we would get a chance to meet a founder when they had three or four stores and talk to them about what we saw in the landscape and the opportunity for 50 stores or what that might look like. Yeah. And I think there was, you know, there's a lot of romance and fun in that process, but it was closely tied to identifying early trends and early product, and I liked all of that. And so at the end of the cycle, I said, you know, the cycle has played out. Um, one cycle's played out, another cycle will start. I don't know what that is. Obviously, technology has some part of it. Uh, um, I think early days, you know, there was a lot of enthusiasm around Amazon and eBay and the access they were providing. But I'd always come at shopping from a standpoint of it was an activity as m almost as much as it was about the item you were buying. Right. And those um, shopping experiences were kind of heavy on leaning towards access as opposed to um, experience. Okay. And so I was like, well, I'm not, I'm not sure this is the answer to shopping, but something's happening here. And if I want to participate in the next generation of companies, um, that probably means doing something early stage. And I don't know what that looks like, and I don't know how to do that, and I don't know where to do that. And I was working 80 hours a week, and I wasn't going to figure it out where I was. So I, you know, somewhat reluctantly and nervously left a good job um, to try to find out, like, how would I go about investing in a private company? To explore. To like, explore. you had no. I did not have a job. You didn't and know I, mean, I, I was. A safety check. I wanted to know like where I was working, where my paycheck yeah, was coming from, yeah. but I was really fueled by like interest in this idea and conviction that while I couldn't pinpoint what something would look like, something new had to be happening. Um, and so I left without a job. I thought I would do some learning and find a place to work. Um, and learning turned into some consulting projects, which was really interesting. You know, investing in, in private companies is totally different than passively investing. Yep. Um, understanding like what were investors looking for, what were founders looking for, what did it mean to be a good partner? Um, you know, how did you run a diligence process? How, you know, all those kinds of things. Like there was a steep learning curve, and I got to work with some people in a consulting capacity that let me learn with them hmm. um, and that was interesting and I also took time um, to meet start meeting with entrepreneurs um, and I you know I, I think I was just eager to learn and so someone had a business I, I had no money you know I wasn't in, I wasn't posing as an investor but I was eager to learn and people would you know there wasn't a lot of people interested in commerce and so somebody said like oh there's a small startup doing this oh you should talk to Kirsten I mean the world gets small fast yeah. and so you know over the years I kind of built up a good pipeline of connections and it was always like she'll talk to you about your business and we'll you know chat about it and um, I think that that gave me a unique window into the earliest stages while the consulting work was helping me understand the institutional process. Yep. And uh, about three years into it, I looked up and thought, I didn't mean to run a consulting business. I really wanted to be an investor. I really got to think about how to transition this effort into investing. And I started to, I found a, I met a founder I liked who I thought had a lot of potential in her business. And I was eager to maybe do something to be helpful. And the thing that I knew was, why don't I raise some money for you and then see what we can do together. Oh. So I did that. And over the course of the three years following, I did like seven investments on single purpose vehicles to took board seats, kind of got engaged. It was my own little entrepreneurial journey. That's and right. I think I read this. You, transition. You like created a new fund, SPV, for each yeah. I mean, investment, I, I right? Thought, like, I haven't made an investment. I don't have a track record I can point to. Yeah. What person is going to give me money to just make my own decisions? But I could stand behind a deal. 
I, I could come and talk about a business. I could articulate why I was excited about it, what I thought the opportunity is. And ultimately, at that point, you're asking an investor to make a decision on a business as opposed to just, hey, I'm Kirsten, it's, I've got some good like ideas. It's Angelist syndicate before I guess so, yeah. Angelist even in yeah. existed, right? I mean, when right? I was doing this, I didn't, I didn't really know the difference. I didn't know what the angel term was. I'm yeah. not sure. This is 2006. It was, you know, Josh Koppelman was early to it, Mike Maples, right but maybe it didn't exist more starting, than that. Right? So um, I did that for a few years in 2008. I thought I had a pretty good little portfolio of companies and that it might be time to explore what a fund might look like. And so I started to talk to people right about the same month Bear Stearns crashed. Nice. And then Lehman Brothers crashed. And then I decided, <laughs> like, it's hard enough to raise a first-time fund and I think I would be fighting the tape, so to speak. So I figured I should spend my time seeing if there's anything I can do to be helpful to my companies that are now battling it out in a tough economic environment. Yeah. And I did that while I continued to meet with entrepreneurs. And then like, something happened. Like through that bad, you know, th on the other side of kind of 07, 08 and the turmoil, people started to, I started to get a different cal, and maybe part of it was because I was like being brought up through the system, but I also think there was a different caliber of founders and entrepreneurs that were thinking about commerce and thinking about commerce in the context of technology and how to bring all the new tools together. I think you know Facebook was really becoming big and mainstream. Yeah. People were suddenly thinking, oh, I could find customers on Facebook. You know, A lot of things were coming into play to kind of create viability around starting a business online. Because before, you were just like a website hanging out in the breeze. I right. mean, the first right. investment I made in 2006, it was specifically in a category where I felt like we could find cohorts of customers naturally. It was in the pregnancy space and you know that's this time in your life where people are looking for education and community and they're aggregating to these particular sites so you right. could find them but otherwise it was hard to find a customer Facebook started that happening anyway so I think there was like a, a path around launching and, and staging a business where people started to recognize and so I felt like the caliber of ideas and the caliber of people were starting to really pick up and yeah. um, I met the teams from Warby Parker and Birchbox while they were still in school um, wow. and they were How? pretty committed. How did you meet them? What, what, what? Again I'd spent like hours in coffee shops talking to people I because see. it was fun. Yeah. It was fun. Um, so anyways with with that and some visibility into like here are some practical examples of companies that I think are good prospects. I started I, I had a small I had a a, somebody I'd known for 20 years who I think had seen me evolve in my thinking in my career who was willing to get into business with me. Oh, and so okay. that was my source of, of capital to start putting a fund together. Um, it was like your friends and family to get going. A little right? bit, yeah. And, then, oh, yeah. Awesome. and at that point I had like deal flow and a thesis, but I needed to figure out what it meant to be in venture and what was going on with the micro VC funds. And that was all new. And I think once I kind of understood that and had a perspective on how we could participate in that ecosystem, it felt time to raise an institutional fund. That's so awesome. it's a long path and that yeah. was a long story. Well, so and sorry continues, about that. right? So, <laughs> yeah. um, well, so let, let's, you, you know, you decided to focus specifically on commerce and I don't know, do you invest outside of commerce or just commerce? So, you know, I think about our effort as thematically oriented. Um, and so, you know, anything that has to do with a customer uh, transaction is interesting to okay. us. Um, I think it's important to have, I think it's a real advantage to have a connected theme. Yes. Um, we spend all day, every day thinking about who buys what, how, where. Um, and there can be many synergies between companies of all different, uh, that are in service to that goal in many different ways. Yeah. So we, we invest in both B2C companies, so that would be um, you know, a product driven company that is leveraging technology, particularly to go to market. Um, retail plays that are starting online, marketplace plays, these on-demand mobile platforms. Obviously, mobile is a huge movement. Yeah. And then we're also interested in the B2B space, the tools and technologies that are enabling a lot of these companies, enabling is, the early stage companies. That's and how we That's how we met, that. right. Yep. And you know, and, and, and your effort was in this whole idea of helping to bridge the gap between the massive business that has traditionally been offline that needs to now upgrade to meet the modern consumer's demands exactly. by integrating technology. Yep. So it's like a lot of opportunities opportunities across a lot of different businesses, but it's there's a thematic tie-in. Great. Well, so, um, you know, one of the things you and I talked about before the show a little bit is um, just Silicon Valley and diversity. And, uh, you know, I, I'd love to get um, your perspective on this because, you know, the, there's all this talk about the lack of women in startups, lack of women in venture capital, how, how they've been treated historically. and um, 
you know, sexism in Silicon Valley. We saw a very high profile lawsuit recently, which, uh, uh, you know, was, was uh, I think Silicon Valley in particular was riveted to, you know, just to see what was going on there. So um, talk about how you view that, that whole um, topic and then, you know, if there are ways we might be able to, uh, to address it and improve it. Um, I'd love, love to hear your thoughts. Well, one thing that I think is, is positive and a move forward is that we're having this conversation. I mean, here I am to talk to you for 45 minutes and there's a lot of things we could talk about and this is the third or second question. Yeah. And that's kind of been my experience with a lot of people where we've had a chance to sit down and talk for a story or an article or something and we want to talk about this. And so it's 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 good that it's on people's mind that people are willing to elevate it to public conversation because those things need to happen because ultimately the healthiest way to um, broaden the diversity in business is for more people to feel like there's a place for them in business yep. and for more people to just throw their hat in the ring and start doing it, right? And um, if there is a perception um, that there's not an opportunity for them that's that's rooted in reality, um, it's hard for that to be, you know, it, 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 there's a process needs to happen for a viewpoint to evolve, and it starts with the conversation because yeah. you can't just all of a sudden flip your switches and have 50-50 parity between males and females in any kind of business partnership. Yeah. Um, you know, I get a lot of calls these days from, from firms um, that say, you know, we're looking to add to our partnership bench. Um, we're looking to broaden uh, our, our views and, and the discussion we're having at the table, and we'd like we we're, we're, would like to find a woman, you know. Um, oh, trying to recruit you to join. I don't think they're trying to firm. recruit me. I think they're, you know, trying to figure Maybe out if they have, if if I know some some uh, women. Got and it. so, but it takes a while. I don't know. Maybe. It Took me 10 years to get to a place where somebody wanted to, you know, have me as an investor in their company. Yeah. So I mean, it's a process to go through. So you can't just flip the switch and turn it on right away. Yeah. So I think having the conversation is important. Bringing it to light is important. Um, I think telling the stories about things that have happened that are unfortunate or shouldn't have happened or bad behavior, or whatever, are important too. Because maybe people don't really understand what that looks like. Maybe they don't realize that they're doing it. I like yeah. to give people the benefit of the doubt. I think most people are well intentioned. There's always some bad apples. I'm not sure we can change them, but we need to bring the rest of the world up to speed on the topic. Um, and then, you know, personally, I I have always operated in the finance field. I was an economics major in school. I mean, maybe there's always been more men in the fields that I've been in than women, and I haven't, you know, I've kind of just accepted it, and I've just sort of learned to power through it a little bit, and I think some of that's required, too. Yeah, um, absolutely. Some of that's required. So. Um, and that's part of just, you know, identifying your own strengths and weaknesses, your own um, advantages and disadvantages. And sometimes being a woman in this business is a disadvantage, but honestly, sometimes it's an advantage, too. And I think that um, before I didn't want someone to just, like, to say to me, like, we really want a female member on the board, and for that to be the reason, I wanted it to be like, well, don't you think that I have a great perspective or I'm intelligent yeah. or whatever? But at the end of the day, if I want to get in that company and I think I can be a good partner and an investor and it's great for my investors and my portfolio and they want me on there because I'm a woman, like, okay, I'll earn some other reputation when I'm there. See, and I, just be okay with it. I but. remember when we first met and um, we were introduced by Russ Siegelman and yep. it, was, it was a great introduction. And I, when I met you, I said, oh my God, she knows a ton about the retail space. And, and that's what it was about, right? It, yep. it, it was... We can we can add this person who can bring this perspective on something that we're going to need to be really good at, and and you know who who knows it better than you do, and so that that's what it was about for me. But I, going back to your point about the um, you know people not wanting to talk about certain things, and I, I think the same thing is true of just bad behavior by VCs in general, yep. not, independent of sexism or anything else. And I I know stuff that's happened to me where you know, you want to take a stand and you want to say something, but you're also fearful of the retribution that comes. Yep. Like if you speak out against the mighty, you know, big VC firm and you say what it was really like, um, you know, they may blacklist you. And in fact, I've, I've had some some situations like that where right. it's, it's like, you know, you, you, you want to let other people know, but you also don't want to, like, completely ruin your ability to function in the industry, right? So it's got to be... You certainly do, but I think you got to, like, navigate life with a willingness to have a point of view, to stand up for it, yep. um, and have integrity around it, and be okay with the fact that maybe there's 
somebody or some small or large group of people that aren't going to agree with you and aren't going to embrace you. Yep. I mean, it, yep, that's, that's hard. It it's been that's been something for me that's been a real journey to try to get to a place where I might be okay with that. I'm still yeah. learning to. Uh, yeah. You know, it's a lot easier to be liked than not. But sometimes you you earn more for be for being willing to take a hard stand on no, something it's, too. No, it's, it's great, and I'm I'm glad we're talking about it. Um, in fact, we we took even more time than we normally do in this segment. But I, I think it's an important topic, and I'm glad uh, we got to spend some time on it. But let's um let's see if we can take some questions All and right. help some. Uh, some startups out. Um, once again, if you uh, want to reach us, you can email us. The email address is help at founderline.com or you can tweet to at founderline. So uh, let's, let's just spend about 15 minutes on questions and then we'll move on to, um, to our sponsor thank yous. So the first one is an email from Tyler and uh, I think that's a guy. Um, what are the key factors in your deciding to meet with an entrepreneur about their company? What are the key factors in your deciding to invest in that company? So the first time maybe you hear about them, you, I don't know how you get most of your pitches. The email comes in and you have to yep. screen it somehow. So what, what gets you to pick up the phone or respond back and what gets you to um, bring them in for a meeting afterwards? What are the key things? Um, so that's been a transition, right? Because at one point I, I was so eager to take every meeting because I wanted to learn, because I had time, um, and I found a lot of value in that. And ideally in a perfect world, I would still be able to do that. Um, I, 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 I can't think of many meetings where I feel like I've wasted time. There's always something to learn if sure. you're interested, um, but it's just unrealistic. And because, you know, really we see 150 deals a month. Um, and we can't pass on things because they're not a fit for us because they're already we've already created a filter with our thematic focus. Ah. So kind of having a process and including our whole team on it, which is small but mighty, um, has been really important. You know, and I think that it's a combination of. Um, having some upfront ideas on areas you're interested in. So we have one person on our team who's doing research projects at all times, who's really trying to kind of think about where are some of the key opportunities we'd like to invest in. So those categories are on alert to us. So that might catch our attention if okay. it's something we're already looking for. Like we're looking at this category. Yeah. Oh, look, here's a Here's something like that, right? Or we've or... seen three of these come through, something's going on, ah. like let's try to figure it out. Like, okay. you know, we try to do that as much of that on our own though. We want to, I want to respect people's time too, right? So we don't take meetings to just be learning. We try to learn a little bit before when we see something happening. I mean, obviously, this is an answer that probably most people in my chair will give, and it's a legitimate answer. It depends on where your introduction comes from. Uh -huh. And, you know, I used to feel like, oh, it's kind of a crappy answer, but it's, it's a realistic answer. Like, Joe, if you send something, we've known each other. You understand me. I understand you. Yep. I know what your filter is. You know the things that I get excited about. Like, I'm going to look at that, right? Um, so once Thank in a while. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, it's legit. The, the checks so in the mail. everyone send your deals to The checks in the mail. <laughs> Um, so, um, you know, it, 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 but it's hard. It's hard when you've got uh, 150, you know, whatever. Um, but so there's, there's something about the people that it comes through. There's something about the particular area. There's also, like, we're building a portfolio. We're looking for diversification. If we're already allocated in some area, like, that's a legitimate reason why we can't really dig into a new company. It's not a good use of either person's time. Like a competitive issue? Yeah. Okay. Um, what are we looking for? So I think that there's like uh, there's there's two main buckets to talk about here. Um, one are sort of the things that I think are table stakes and are kind of more like general. I expect anybody that's doing investing to look at, right? So um, big market. Um, there's something going on with the consumer in that market or the delivery mechanism or the service mechanism that's making the incumbents like less interesting to the consumer so they're okay. vulnerable okay. right so big market and a vulnerability of incumbents are important right um, because a lot of the businesses that we're uh, investing in have products or services, we really try to you know, think about does the economic model make sense up front. Mm. So I mean, maybe that is something that I think you know, in venture, you do need to leapfrog ahead and take big risks and not have all the questions answered. And this is something I've continued to push myself on because I like to know as many answers as possible. Yes. And it's like part of taking risks. Yes. But there are also things that you learn after time. Like it's really hard if you're selling an item for this 
and you think you're going to do these three things to bring it to market that you're ever going to make money, right? So kind of just a base level of understanding, like does the economic model make sense? Like low margins are bad. Low Whether margins are bad. Regular and retail or online or anywhere know, else. You know, you got to have room to yeah. do the things that are important because the things that we're really looking for that maybe are unique are great experiences. So I feel like having a product that aligns with value is just, that's just the ticket to get in the door. Like you better have a product that the consumer wants at the price you're offering it, and that's a product or a service or a platform or a social network or whatever the case may be. Like yeah. you just have to have. And then, you know, it's very hard to build a business off of price competition because it's usually like a race for the bottom, um, unless you're Amazon and you can just win on girth. Um, right. And then um, access is hard to compete on too because at some level or shape or form, almost everything is available from more than one place. So we try to really think about what is the opportunity to create a really unique experience. Because experience can be something that you can build a relationship from and have loyalty from. And we're really interested in businesses that have repeat businesses where the customer is going to come back often and yep. do business with you often. Got it. All right, great. Well, Tyler, I uh, hope that helps. And uh, send your ideas and and uh, they'll they'll take a look I'm sure so let's um, let's move on uh, we have one here from Mikey in New York uh, hello Mikey I know he's been listening and watching regularly um, his question is how does your firm handle a portfolio company that becomes somewhat successful but is not a home run how does that impact your investment in other companies in a similar space what about opportunity cost great question this so, is a really good question yeah it's a really good question um, Right now, I would say we, we, we think a lot about um, honoring our founders by protecting kind of a vertical and not having overlap and competition within the portfolio. And that is a reason that the bar is that much higher, right? If we invest in one company doing X, Y, and Z, like that's it. And we're trying to make these decisions at the very earliest stages, which are hard. Yeah. And sometimes you do end up with a company that there was something fundamentally flawed in the initial plan, or it was harder to build a team. I mean, any, I mean, thousands of things can happen, right? right? right. So I think that um, it's been a journey for me to figure out, like, how, how do you interact? I think you've got to figure out the right amount of time to spend with somebody to try to be helpful. Um, but at the end of the day, like, if if me or my team are running the company or too close to it, like that's a problem because that's not what we do or yeah. not what we're good at. Yeah. You know, so I, I do try to figure out like what are the top three or four priorities? What, what are the things that we might be able to do to help facilitate those? Um, and, um, you know, hopefully that results in tangible support and emotional <laughs> support. Um, and um, an open dialogue. So I think one secret to this business, or secret or whatever, but is like having a conversation with your founders about what you're both interested in doing. Like, and this comes up so many times in business when we're negotiating a deal or when we're talking about like, it's not working, what does this mean? What does this look like? It's about, be, it's about embracing it as a partnership and being honest. Like, it's about what's good for the founder. It's about the founder understanding, like, what am I aiming for? I mean, I sat down with some founders and said, listen, I care about you personally. And if I didn't have a responsibility to my LPs and, like, 10 other companies I need to deal with, I would spend a lot of time doing this. But at this point, like, relative to where it fits into the mix of our portfolio, I can't. Yep. You know, and yep. that's just being honest. And, like, you know, hopefully that gets some respect and understanding and might be hard for ask the founder to feel like that in the moment but that's the best I can do so have you have you done a competitive investment in a, a space like you know I don't, I don't think you have if I had, some, if I had and, something that I felt like was doing I've always called the founder to talk about it yeah in yeah. fact, in and fact I've never, I think that happened with us I think you had a company like sort of in customer service generally I forget yeah there was on, something on like the that East Coast. Was it? and I, I thought it was great it was like uh, the first I, I, it was um Something to do with customer service, and uh, I, I can't remember the name of the company, okay. but um, but I thought, oh, it's Again, great. Like she called me up and asked, or same, emailed same, me. Same yeah. uh, point of view, you know, just talk about it, yeah. air it, and uh, and have a conversation. As opposed to Dave McClure, who, oh yeah, I, I oh knew, yeah, that thing. I knew and love you, Dave. Dave's been on the show. Yep. He's a great guy, but uh, he he didn't get the update that we were going into this other area, and then like a month later, he funded like a, an identical company, which was pretty funny. But uh, I do remember that. Yeah, that was a little crazy. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that that was just because of the sheer volume they're doing. All right, um, Mikey, thanks for the question. Let's move on. Um, we have one from Emily. Uh, this one says. 
First, thank you for your leadership as a woman in venture capital. Mm -hmm. Do you find the Silicon wonderful. Valley community to be an old boys network where you're not taken seriously and or and or have to work harder than the men? What do you think? I want the truth. I don't want the sugar-coated version. You know what? That hasn't been my experience. Great. It hasn't been my experience, and I think, you know, um, I can... I, I can I can appreciate that that is a reality, and I I think that other people have had that experience, mm. and I think maybe mine is a bit unique because I've leaned on this category focus, yeah, right, and so there's been something to build mindshare around Forerunner, around like we're investing in a certain kind of businesses, we have a certain network, we have a certain like uh, you know playbook that we've learned. Right. Um, and so it's not a conversation just about personal relationships that, that, that relies on personal relationships, history of doing deals together, et cetera, et cetera. Got and it. I think that's probably been helpful. Um, I actually, one of the things that I like about venture is that it is a collaborative business. I mean, when I started Forerunner, I had no intention, I, I never wanted to do something by myself. Like, I think it's so much more powerful when you have a team of smart people around hashing out ideas. And it's best when you disagree and you can really get into it, particularly Absolutely. when you're contemplating an investment, you yep. know. And um, our team does that all the time. And it makes the job much more fun, and I think it makes it better at what we do. And so, you know, if you get it right and you get a group of investors around the table that all bring a different, a little bit of different perspective, but a commitment to a shared goal, obviously that's the key thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's pretty fun, yeah, you know? And absolutely. it's like, we have a small team at Forerunner, but I don't ever feel like we're operating in a small team because we have partners like at all these other firms that we truly do collaborate with. At the early stage absolutely. in particular, you think about like, what's the syndicate we're putting together? And who's doing the heavy lifting? You know, sometimes that firm's doing it, sometimes we're doing it, and you, and you try to be conscious of that. Well, and that's what's hard about angel investing is you are on your own. And, and it does get a little bit lonely, honestly. I, I, and so the situations have been best where I'm working with somebody else, as yeah. you say. Yeah, and you find your goal. few people that you like, you know, that you share ideas and deals and can talk about things. Absolutely. And, yeah. No, that's great. So, um, all right, Emily, well, I hope that helps. Um, let's do one more and before we get to uh, commercials here. So um, this one is from, uh, let's see, this one is from Abe. When you invest in a company and you're not seeing the progress you were hoping for, do you get less or more involved? How can you correct the issue? So, so this we happens. always get more involved for a period of time. Okay. Like we have to have some boundaries around that, but we made an investment, we entered a partnership, um, we care about it for our own portfolio, we care about it for the commitment of partnership, we do what we can. Um, and, and a, you know, a handful of times that that's led to a great result, you know, and, and getting more involved. Yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. So what, what sorts of things like is this helping with recruiting or is it mostly like well, that, some sort of. So then there's this whole thing that's just like table stakes of being in this business, so just, like recruiting, yeah. right? You're investing in early stage companies. Your goal and your hope is that they're going to grow. No one's going to grow without a team and talent. And every company, because it's early stage by definition, is resource constrained. So I think the expectation is, is like, hey, you have a network. You guys are out in the field doing this all the time. Other companies are hiring. You know what interviewing questions to ask. So like, that's something to do. But yeah. like, you know, one example would be, um, it is extraordinarily, I mean, I've, I can't imagine, I have so much respect for a, a founder of a company because it requires so many skills to, to, to be successful. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. Um, and it is really hard to keep your eye on the ball all the time, right? And so a lot of times, like for instance, you have a team that's really focused on top line and they're doing everything they can to accelerate growth at growth at growth. And then you're like, um, at this rate and with this model, are we going to make money? <laughs> you know, and yeah. um, you yeah. know, I think we had an example like that, and we came in and really talked about like the importance of that. Like the growth is really important. Like that's what you sign up for VC, you're signing up for aggressive growth. That's the plan, but not at all costs. Not you know, particularly not when you don't know where the next dollar is coming from. And so we got in to kind of you know talk about unit economics and think about like, are we optimizing? what we're charging for this product. What is there some element of this people are willing to pay for more? Does it, how do how do we mm. what, make this work? And it was super exciting because they ended up uh, having a profitable month, two months while they were still having really high growth and attracting a great 
follow on round of funding. Wow. And so, so like that's was, when your business job is really fun. It feels really satisfying. It was a change to the pricing model. And I'm not taking credit. I mean, I don't think we no. would ever take credit for that, but it was about like initiating that conversation. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was, it, was a, it was a bunch of little things, honestly. You know, it was a Got bunch it. of kind of really looking at it and saying, like, oh, if we're doing delivery, like, is there a delivery charge? If we're, Do we need to pay for taxes? Like, could they right. pay for taxes? Right. Like, do we need to have a lower entry point and maybe, like, a higher entry po a higher price point yeah. to kind of widen the range? I mean, it's usually a bunch of things like that. That's great. That's awesome. Well, um, uh, let's see. Abe, I hope, uh, hope that helps. So we're going to... Um, Take a moment here to thank uh, some of our sponsors. So sit back right. and relax while I uh, pay the bills here. Um, you know, we, we couldn't do this show without the amazing support we get from our sponsors. And um, we have four great sponsors for this season of Founderline. They are uh, Oric, Square One Bank, Accretive Solutions, and Ustream. So let's start out with Oric. Um, I've been working with Mitch Zookley over there for a long time and on multiple companies. And I always tell entrepreneurs that when you're starting out, you want to get uh, a great lawyer, not so much because of the legal paperwork and you know the employment contracts and the financing documents and all that. As, as Kirsten just said, it's table stakes, right? They have to be able to do that stuff and do a good job. But the most important thing you get from your lawyer is the advice because they have seen so many more uh, financings than you have. They've seen more hirings and firings than you'll ever see in your lifetime. And so having that perspective and being able to go to them and say, hey, is this market for this sort of situation? Is this typical? You know, this VC is asking for X. We don't think that's normal. What do you think? And they, they look back and they go, yeah, no VCs ever asked for that before. That's crazy. So um, that's why you want to get a great lawyer. The team over at Oric is awesome. Uh, I, I know this firsthand. Uh, we're working with them on Founderline today. So um, uh, if you want to find out more about Oric, you can go to their website. Uh, it is oric.com, and I'm sure they'll be able to help you out. Um, next, I want to thank our new sponsor for this season, Square One Bank. I have known the team over there for a long time, uh, Sam uh, Bomick and Lori lamenti and uh, They've been terrific to work with. Um, of course, when you get a bank, uh, you need someone who's going to take care of your money. That's first and foremost. You're not sticking it in a mattress after all, so you want to make sure that your money is safe. But you also want someone who can help you out with some of the uh, things to make your life easier. So uh, things like online banking, uh, getting a corporate credit card so that you know, as a founder or CEO, you're not charging you know, thousands or tens of thousands of dollars to your personal credit card and then something happens and all of a sudden you're stuck, stuck with a bunch of debt that uh, was actually company debt. So um, they can help you out with all these sorts of things and make sure that you're set up on the uh, financial side. Um, you can go and find out more at their website. Uh, it is squareonebank.com. It's square the number one bank.com. Uh, also new for this season is our sponsor, Accretive Solutions, and they are the leading business outsourcing firm in Silicon Valley. And uh, I always joke with uh, Martini Niganel, who's my, my friend over there, you know, what the hell is business outsourcing? And uh, she, she's like, you know, it's, it's sort of your, it's all your finance operations. So it's accounts payable, accounts receivable, your payroll, um, just making sure all the trains are running on time. And um, in my case, I hired Martini to be um, our interim CFO when we didn't really need a full-time CFO. And she brought uh, someone on our team to sort of handle the the, uh, the payroll and all that sort of stuff. She put together all the board packages so we can make sure our uh, investors were up to date on what was happening. So um, uh, you want to make sure that you've got your eye on the really important stuff in your business. And obviously knowing how much runway you have left and all that is, is critical, but you don't need to know the details of, you know, did this person get charged the right, uh, you know, state disability insurance or, you know, anything like that. So uh, turn it over to somebody who's a specialist and let them handle it. Um, you can go check out Accretive Solutions at their website. Their URL is uh, as-bos.com. Uh, finally, I want to thank uh, the team over at Ustream. They were one of our founding sponsors, and one of the reasons we're able to bring you this show live every week. Um, Brad Hunstable and the team over there, Warren Reed, who's been doing uh, a lot of work with us, have been great. Um, their streaming technology is the best, and if you're a company that's um, maybe you have people working in remote locations, or maybe you want to do um, uh, a broadcast to your shareholders or whatever it might be, um, they can help you out with their uh, with their streaming technology and. Um, 
Uh, you can go and find out more. You might even be on their website right now. So uh, go check out ustream.tv, and uh, they should be able to help you out as well. So that's it. That's the, that's the uh, commercials. So All let's right. get back into helping founders. See, we're, we're more than halfway through. We're two-thirds through. Does it feel like it was no, an hour? See, no. I told you. I told you. <laughs> Joe intimidated uh, me about an hour. I was like, how will I talk for an hour? Oh, I, 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 uh, okay. I know you can do it. So um, let's see. This one, uh, we have a, an email here from uh, Michael. And this one says, when you imagine an engineer coding all night, never having a social life, it's common to assume the engineer is male. Even though we've all worked with women engineers that work harder than their male counterparts and are every bit as nerdy as Larry, Sergey, and Zuck. Do you assess women founders differently than men? Is this an issue for VCs, or do they not have these preconceived media-driven images? How do we overcome this? Hmm. Long-winded question. So I don't know if you got the whole gist there, but uh, how about how about you know men and women founders? Like any differences or doesn't doesn't really matter. So one of the things that's <clears throat> that's been really important to us to date um, is why is this person doing this? You know Absolutely. what what is it that's driving them? Yeah. Um, and there can be a lot of different ways that you can answer that question. It could be like. I had the problem myself, and now I want to solve it. Yep. It could be that, like, I know something special about this from my past work experience that gives me an advantage. Yep. Or, you know, I mean, there can be any number of things. And so, to me, I want to understand that motivation. And the lens is, is that it is hard to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> you know and it, right? It is hard to be an entrepreneur, and on some level, unless you have, like, it deep in your belly that this is what you must do with your life, um, it it might be it might be easy to give up when things get hard, yep. right? And yep. like I think it's just pretty much safe to assume things are going to be hard. So that's been like that that has served us well, and that lens has um, organically built a portfolio or lent itself to a portfolio where there are I don't know the exact numbers I don't track it but like half women founders and half male founders. Hmm. There are authentically like geared towards what they're doing. So and that, that feels that feels good to me. So it and sounds I, like it doesn't matter. I guess not. Yeah. So I th guess not. there are, you know, the founders of Warby Parker were really into eyeglasses or whatever and uh, I, I believe they're all male if I They are. And and So know. the first two investments we made were um, in the fund were Warby Parker and um, Birchbox. You know, one team of men, one team of women. Oh interesting. Um, and they both like had that had that reason for doing what they were doing in you know it was like and I, I kind of said that like I'm like all oh, these you know here are some people who are in business school or in top business schools they could do anything they wanted after business school before business school they were doing you know X Y and Z something totally unrelated but like this is what they want to do yeah like this is what yeah. they want to do they want to get scrappy and start a startup I mean this is like when it wasn't like now it's pretty sexy to be an entrepreneur and there's a lot of people that come through that really just want to be entrepreneurs and I I, I certainly think there there are probably case studies, plenty of where people are successful with that mindset. But I think that's harder. We call those entrepreneurs. Yeah, it's harder. Yeah. It's harder. Yeah. Um, so. All right. You know. Great. Well, Michael, I hope that answers your question. Let's move on to um, a question from Eric. This one says, "How much traction or sales growth is required in an e-commerce business before you'll decide to invest?" Do you ever invest in an e-commerce idea that hasn't sold anything yet? Yes. Yes. So um, part of putting together a portfolio is thinking about a diversification of businesses, a diversification of customers you're addressing, so wallet share you're going after, a diversification of um, like linchpins for the business, and a diversification hmm. of stage as much as a small fund allows for, right? So, I mean. <laughs> there's early and there's really right? early, so right? So, I, I think, you know, I think um, doing some things when they're brand new and early makes sense in the context of a portfolio of 16 companies. Doing 12 companies that are really early in the context of a 16 portfo company portfolio does not make sense, yeah, right? Yeah. So, there is, there is, you know, appetite for it, for it in some, some allocation yeah you know? yeah okay yeah. um it's it's i, I will uh, though admit that it's getting I, i'm probably going into um product driven businesses a little bit later um and part of that is um in thinking about the path to scale 
and how big a business needs to be to sort of really access optionality around an exit. Okay. Um, I think you know you have to consider in the context of I'm investing a fund with a 10-year life. Yeah. Yep. You know, and sometimes if you invest post product launch, you've taken two years off the time frame, yep. and that can be meaningful. So again, that like plays into the portfolio strategy. So would you say the majority of your, your investments are like that? Like they've launched, maybe they have some traction. You can kind of yeah. you, you don't know how the hockey stick or the line is going to go, but you, you can We're see something. We are at least live with the product. I, I got We're it. at least live with the product, so that's right? Because a lot of times that is taking a year off of the, of the time frame. Absolutely, right? yeah. Um, but you know, if there's a situation where we know the founder really well, we are like uniquely qualified to be a good partner because we know the supply chain and we can maybe help speed it up or, so, or something, you know, yeah, or, our yeah. contacts can, um, then, then maybe that works. Okay. You know? All right. Well, um, Eric, I hope that helps, uh, helps you out a little bit. Let's move on to, this one's from Manny. Uh, do you attend demo days for the various incubators like YC, Techstars, et cetera? If so, what do you look for? And if not, why not? Okay, um, we do. Um, somebody from our team goes. So you split them up. You know, split them up. Because there's so many of them there's, now. It's... There's so many of them, and I'm not sure we go, I mean, I'm sure we don't go to all of them, right? Uh -huh. But ones where we have relationships with the people that are leading them, we go to. I think it's an important part about being part of the community, seeing what else is going on, yep. um, hearing what I, what founders that are already screened are are looking at you know I mean again we get this funneled deal flow that gives us a window into kind of something broader than yeah. what maybe naturally comes across our desk so from that standpoint that's interesting too um, so I, I think we're there more for kind of that breadth of experience than we are to find like the next investment okay. you know um, I, I, I think we probably hold ourselves a little bit to the standard of like if you're learning about it for the first time when you're there that maybe we were not doing our job the way we should have been or uh, something. I don't know, but uh, I mean, we have invested in companies post demo days, so you know there is <laughs> there is a there's a case on both sides. Yeah. You know? Well, I, I mean, one of the things I find most interesting as an investor is sort of the just the mind candy of like going totally. there and getting exposed to you know. In the case of YC, what was it, 110 or 20 That's companies? That's amazing. And it, it's a little overwhelming, actually. Like, your your mind kind of goes it's numb a, after a while. I actually, I think it's a lot overwhelming. And, and but, you're sitting there, and you're just like, wow, that's just like the one I just saw like 10 minutes ago, but I can't remember. You know, like, you, you really have to take notes mm -hmm. and keep track. But I, I just love the diversity and the... Um, you know the breadth of ideas, especially right. you know they're doing like nuclear fusion, it's, oh, it's and inspiring. Like crazy stuff, right? Yeah. So, uh, so I, I think I think it's great, but um, but it is as an investor, it's really hard to look at all those. You for maybe maybe for you guys, it's a little easier because you have your theme and you can sort of go. Well, that's not really related we can, but to... You, you, you said it really well. Like, the real reason to go is kind of for that expansive experience, yeah. right? Yep. And it is, and, and I think it's great when a founder comes in and says, like, we, you know, we were at this demo and I said, oh, yeah, we saw you there. Like, here's what we, you know, what our gut impression is. And we're kind of, like, already up the curve on, on a conversation or something. So it's good from that standpoint, too. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Um, all right. So I forget who that one was from, but uh, we'll move on to the next one. This one is from uh, Teresa or Teresa. Why do some e-commerce companies succeed where others fail? Are there any specific attributes of the business or team that are leading indicators of success or failure? That is a great question. That is a really so, good question, and there are a lot of answers. So let me highlight maybe I want the all thing of that the I think is like that I, that I would key in. The first thing that came to mind while I was hearing that question. Okay. I think it is necessary um, to have a marketing advantage of some sort. So really, there are pretty low barriers to entry in terms of putting up a site and even getting a product and putting it up for sale, right? Okay. Um, so what's increasingly hard is to rise above the noise, right? And it's also really important to have deliver a great experience and something that people will get talking about um, but in order to even get that first wave of, of, of customers, you really have to have some reason that you're going to get above the noise. Okay. So I, I do, we do give a lot of thought to like, is there a potential for such a cheesy word, but an unfair marketing advantage, hmm. you know? And what, and like, how do you, you're a startup, you don't have any money or you have a little bit of money. So how do you, you know, you, you start selling widgets online, whatever they are. And, um, how do you, how do you do that? Is it like PR stunts and... 
you know, really good viral marketing, you know, growth hacker stuff? Or what, so what are the... ultimately, you need to be able to do everything. Ultimately, okay. you know, when someone comes in, they're like, oh, you know, you're involved in X, Y, and Z company, like, you must really know what about marketing, you know, this and that. And I yeah. think, well, what we know is that it's really important to be, like, in front of the curve on all these different channels and get them interplaying together. Yeah. Like, you just really can't say, we're going to do just Facebook, or we're going to just do Google Words, or we're going to just do a viral campaign. I mean, it just doesn't work. You have to do everything. And I think that's more true than ever now, because people's attention is all over the place. Yeah. And... Um, and that's important. And also, fundamentally, through age-old times, like there's a lot of data that shows that the customer needs to be touched multiple times before yeah. they'll make a purchase. Yeah. So, but beyond all of that, like, is there something that you can own, right? So let's Dollar Shave Club is an example Great. that's easy for people to understand, yeah. right? So at Dollar Shave Club, like the the actual magic marketing is that we do a little bit of everything and we do most of it pretty well. But we got in the game and we got going because we had a video that people, that really resonated with people. It, it really resonated, the message resonated, the humor resonated, and it felt like something you wanted to share and talk about, and it had legs. Um, and so that got us in the game. It got a few customers engaged. Um, it set like a tone and a strategy for content and for a voice for the brand, which is really important, right? right. So that's one of these things that sometimes can be hard to explain because there's some intangibleness to it. But like, does your brand have a personality? Is there a way to articulate that in your product, in your packaging, in your customer service, in your price point, in your banner ads, in your hmm. viral campaigns, that kind of ties together to support that. But you really have to have like a point of view to even have a chance at doing that. And they, they knew that going in, like, yeah, we're gonna sell commodity, you know, razors and razor blades, but we're gonna, the way we're gonna solve that is by having this personality. Was that their, their take on the business? You know, um, I think it was it was more than that. It was it was definitely more than that. Okay. And and I think about like in that particular case, I mean I remember somebody saying to me, you know, this idea about the razor company and I was like, I'm not sure, you know, it's like a low it's a low dollar item, it's a competitive market. Yeah. Obviously there's some players with billions of dollars, like is that really viable? Um, and then I met Michael and um, I didn't even see the video, but he was able to like really articulate a whole vision for the company huh. um, and, and how they were gonna be different. And a lot of that was grounded in having this persona personality that was going to come through in content, that was gonna come through in the positioning of the product, in the way it was delivered to you and service and everything. That made it really compelling. Awesome, well, that's great, great, great success story. Um, all right, so uh, Teresa, hope that, hope that helps. Um, Let's move on to Derek. Uh, Derek says, our company is struggling a bit after raising a seed round last year. Sales aren't what we had hoped, and I worry we will run out of money before we can show meaningful traction. We have about six months of cash remaining. Do you have any suggestions for what we can do to improve sales and or convince our existing investors to help us out with a bridge? So sadly, um, there are lots of companies in this That's situation, really, right? There are lots of companies. Um, There's lots of companies with great products, great ideas, great teams. You know, it's 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 an extraordinarily it's hard to be an entrepreneur. Yep. It's a hard category. Absolutely. The bar continues to go up for the kind of sales momentum you show in a way that even intimidates me. I mean, I think one of our biggest hurdles in an investment decision is like are we gonna meet the criteria to get the next round of funding? You know, mm. and I don't think anybody should build their company just for the funding round, but you have to think about it because you need the capital and you need that support in order to build a business. And you know, there is there there are things that people are looking for that they have learned from their own experience are signals to companies that fit the profile of a venture backed company. There's a lot of companies that we see that we say and sincerely like this is a good this is a good product. You can build a nice business. Yeah. I'm not sure you want to have people that are like is there a billion dollars in 5 years, right. you know? And right. so I think kind of really understanding like what is the company opportunity that we have? What is what is reasonable that an ambitious team can achieve and what is the right funding source for that? Hmm. Um so you know, I think that um it's been great that there is access to capital in a much more democratic way and that you can really, you know, 
fairly readily raise a seed round, and that's not to take anything away from the respect that somebody deserves for raising a seed round. Yeah. But I don't know that that means that you have to just be focused on getting like the few firms on Sand Hill Road to fund your business. Like you maybe ought to, you know, kind of be open-minded a little bit about like what are the other ways in which you could continue to fuel the business and maybe have a broader definition of success. And so any specific advice for Derek where you know, they're, they're running low on cash, right? And um, I, I mean, I think in terms of improving sales, it's, it's getting good at all the things you mentioned earlier, right? Like, you gotta be good at everything. So maybe there are some channels It's or hard, It's tactics. hard to answer that without knowing the product, Ex right? Exactly. But again, I'll exactly. go back to something. Is there, is there some part of the marketing case that you could own, right? So if you are, um, you know, maybe you're you're running low on cash, so you can't just throw tons of money at tons of things and say that you're good at this whole melting pot. But can you do something like scrappy and extraordinary in social hmm. that is a brand builder that also gets people buzzy talking about and sort of right. you know demonstrate that like the people want the product if you get the word out there more. You're starting to unlock some channels, but you really need resources to do that. Yeah. I think that. Um, you know, there was sort of these natural cycles where companies would do proof points that would unlock rounds of funding. And one of them is to say, like, we can, we have a vision for a product. We, we created a product. We brought it to market. The customer wants it, right? Now we need funding to demonstrate, like, the articulate the business model and prove that out. Yep. And that feels like a Series A. And then a Series B feels like we, we know it. We know how to spend the money, and here we're going to go get it. Yep. So, you know, I think kind of framing your business in that context too and making sure that you've answered as many questions as you can that like we're part of, you know, time and team involved and then taking the limited resources that you have and show that you can get the product in people's hand and that they like it. Like so, I, I you know, immediately focus on like can you drive repeats? Like that's a big thing too, yeah, right? Yeah. So that says the pr person, not only did you have a message that got somebody inspired to buy it, but the product was good, the service was good and they came back. Um, Makes sense. It's it's hard to know, Derek, without seeing it. The other advice I would give you is a lot of times universally true, I, I see um, companies where they, they they go really broad and they just try and get everybody to buy their product. And I would say, I, not knowing what your company is or the product, like try and focus really in on a geography or a customer segment or a something totally. like like That's a great smaller advice, a smaller thing. And see if you can, with your six months left, if you can get that thing working. Like, That's right. Maybe you can get the segment the know, audience or segment the program, yeah, but get something. You know, moms in Mountain View, like own moms in Mountain View for whatever it is, or in, yeah. you know, thirty-something uh, males in uh, in Egypt, or I, you know, I'm making this stuff yeah. up, but um, that that might help. Um, that's great. And bridge, bridge rounds are really hard, so. Um, that's to me. That's all about the relationship with your investors, and if you can prove to them that it makes sense to uh, go. I mean, this is one of those areas that sometimes involves a, requires a conversation where there's added transparency. Because I think, like from the founder side, like I really understand. Like, hey, you gave me money. Like, I've done a bunch of things. I need just a little bit more to prove. And another thing, like, why wouldn't you give me another hundred thousand dollars to save your five hundred? I, like, I get that mentality. Yeah. But the bar that we're up against is like making decisions with every dollar that we can talk to about the people's money that we're managing. So yeah. there's, there is a difference that happens when you're managing your own money versus somebody else's money and I'm accountable, like I have a boss, a lot of them a actually, lot of them. <laughs> and I'm accountable to that, you yeah. know, and they kind of said like, well, we will never, you know, it's venture, we'll, we won't fault you for making some investments that don't work out, but if you chase investments or down, like, you know, that's harder to understand yeah, so like that's, absolutely you know. well and, and Derek my last piece of advice there would be um, for bridges is like to go out and uh, and meet the investors in person like go talk to your investors don't send them emails don't do it over the phone like um, th things are different when you're yeah. in person and uh, uh, you know it may or may not work but uh, hope hope that helps so um, so hey, believe it or not we are out of time can you believe it did it go no, fast it went by fast I told it you was see fine. Um, it, it was awesome. So thank you, for, yeah. thank you for doing that. Thanks um, to everybody that sent questions. And yeah. Joe, thanks for having me. Absolutely. And um, you know, if you want to um, follow Kirsten, you can find her on Twitter. Her handle is Kirsten A Green, K I R S T E N A G R E E N, on Twitter. And um, and also Forerunner VC, right? Is the uh, the, the company uh, the yeah. website address is Forerunner Ventures. Oh, Forerunner Ventures, but your Twitter handle. Oh for, yeah, for sorry, runner, for sorry. Runner VC. For um, VC. So you go, you, you, if you Google, you'll you'll find everything. Um, 
So uh, next week, um, tune in for another episode of Founderline. Our guest will be Jason Lemkin. And Jason is a managing director of Storm Ventures, where he focuses on early stage SaaS and enterprise startups. So a little different uh, focus. Um, he's the founder of the Saster community for SaaS executives and previously started a couple of companies, um, EchoSign, which was acquired by Adobe, and uh, also another company called Nanogram. Um, he's an investor in a bunch of SaaS companies, including TalkDesk, Parklet, and Rainforest QA. Um, it'll be a great show. It's next Wednesday at 5 o'clock Pacific time. Thank you once again to our amazing sponsors, Auric, Square One Bank, Accretive Solutions, and Ustream. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at Founderline. You can email us uh, questions for Jason next week um, to uh, help at Founderline.com. Uh, go and check out our website, and uh, you can subscribe to email updates. You can watch the previous episodes. You can read more about upcoming uh, guests, and you can also subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Thanks for watching. Here's to the crazy ones, and we'll see you again next week. Mm -hmm.